Experiment 20 in Chem 1212 is titled pH titration, phosphoric acid in cola drinks. And in this video, I want to focus on three big questions related to titration. First question is, what experimentally is titration? What do we do to accomplish a titration in the laboratory? The second question is, how do we use titration to determine the concentration of an acid? In fact, we've done this already in experiment 21 to determine the concentration of borate, but we're going to look at this question of an acid and pH titration in more detail. And the third question is, what does the shape of a titration curve look like and why does it look that way? And in exploring this, we'll figure out how to use a titration curve to identify the acid dissociation constant, or Ka, of an acid. So our first big question is, what is titration as an experimental method? What does it look like? Well, there are a few key elements to any titration, and I'll focus specifically on pH titration here, although you will see different types of titrations in future experiments. The first thing we need is a beaker containing some solution, and this is typically the unknown solution that we find in the beaker here. The sort of analytical chemistry name for it is the analyte. This is the species that we're analyzing. When it comes to pH titration, this is typically an acid or base whose concentration is unknown. The other thing we need is another solution of known composition that typically comes in an instrument called a burette, which I'm sort of crudely drawing up here, and we call this the titrant. And in acid-base titrations, the titrant is the opposite of whatever the analyte is. So if the analyte is an acid, the titrant is a base, and vice versa. And titration relies on an irreversible, complete reaction between the titrant and the analyte. So when it comes to the titration that you'll perform, the analyte will be a cola solution containing an acid, HA. We'll just simplify it to a monoprotic acid here, although you'll be looking at a polyprotic acid in the lab. And the titrant will be a base, and the base is typically some solution of hydroxide. I think it's sodium hydroxide for this experiment. So how does titration work? Well, you'll have in the analyte a pH electrode. And this will tell you the pH of the solution. So you'll know the initial pH of the solution, and because we're starting with an acid, it will begin acidic. As we drip titrant into the solution, what happens is a reaction between the acid HA and the base, hydroxide. And this is a complete reaction that goes completely to the right, right? Because OH- is a strong base. A- and H2O result. As we add titrant, the pH goes up slowly at first for reasons that we'll see later, but eventually we reach a point when the number of moles of hydroxide added is exactly equal to the number of moles of HA that were present in the analyte originally. And at that point, we reach a special point called the equivalence point. Now, we've done some titrations already, and you'll recognize the equivalence point of this titration as what we called the end point of prior titrations. Remember, in previous titrations, we used an indicator that changed colors when the pH shifted from acidic to basic or vice versa. Here we're not using an indicator, we're actually measuring the pH, but at the equivalence point is where you would notice the color change of an indicator. So those two are conceptually related to one another. This is pretty much all there is to the experimental method of titration. Now the important quantities that come out of this are the volumes of titrant added, let's say it's NaOH, the volume of the NaOH solution that's added, and the shape of the titration curve, or the shape of the pH change as that titrant is added. And for a monoprotic acid, we'll get something that looks a little bit like this, and we'll explain shortly why the curve looks like this, but using special points along the curve, like the equivalence point and halfway to the equivalence point, we can determine useful properties of the analyte solution, like the concentration of HA and the acid dissociation constant of HA. We've already used titration to determine unknown concentrations. Remember in the thermodynamics of borax dissolution experiment, we used it to determine the concentration of hydrochloric acid and that unknown borate concentration. So how is that relevant here in pH titrations? Can we use the data from a pH titration to determine the concentration of an acid HA in the analyte? The answer is yes, and I want you to make connections between the pH curve that you see here 
and the titrations we've done already. So there was a point in the previous titrations where an indicator changed color. The corresponding point on this pH curve is the place where pH is increasing most rapidly, where pH is changing most rapidly. It makes sense that that's where the indicator changes color because the pH is making a rapid jump. So that point on this graph is right in the middle of the titration curve where the slope of the curve is at a maximum. Mathematically, this is what we call a point of inflection. The mathematical definition of a point of inflection is a place where the second derivative of a curve is zero. And what you can notice is that the slope of the titration curve is increasing, getting steeper and steeper until we get to the point of inflection, at which point it starts to flatten out again, so the slope starts to decrease as we move past the point of inflection. This point has a special chemical name. It's called the equivalence point, for reasons that will become clear in a second. What we can say about the equivalence point is that at that point, all of the acid that was present originally in the analyte has been neutralized by the strong base. And so the number of moles of acid that were present in the original analyte is equal to the number of moles of NaOH that have been added to the analyte in the course of this titration. Now, the clever among you will notice that I've replaced the volume of titrant with the number of moles down here. And just as an aside, this is fine because the number of moles and volume are linearly related by the concentration of the titrant, which is a constant. So it's okay to put the number of moles of NaOH on the x-axis of a titration curve. It doesn't really change anything. How does this lead us to the HA concentration? Well, at the equivalence point, we know that the number of moles of NaOH is equal to the number of moles of HA. The number of moles of NaOH is also equal to the volume of NaOH we've added, which we can measure, which we measure using a burette, times its original concentration, which is known to precision, right? It comes on the bottle that we use. The titrant is a known solution, so we know that NaOH concentration. But this is the number of moles of HA present in the original analyte. And we know the volume of the original analyte, right, because we measured it into the beaker at the beginning of the titration. So the volume of the analyte is known too. And this is a number of moles of HA divided by the volume of the analyte. That's the concentration of HA, which is exactly what we were after. So just like we can use the volume of titrant added to an endpoint, we used that in past experiments. Now it's the same idea except we're replacing the sort of qualitative look for a color change endpoint with the quantitative equivalence point, which is by definition a point of inflection on the pH versus volume curve. Finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about why a pH titration curve has the shape it does and how we can use the curve to determine the acid dissociation constant or the Ka of the acid. So we're still talking about titrating an acid as the analyte using a strong base. You can tell that by the initial pH, which starts out low, starts out, let's say, below 7. And I'll just kind of arbitrarily mark 7 here on the graph. As we add NaOH, we know that the acid present in the analyte reacts with the hydroxide to form A- and water. So of course, when we start out before we've added any sodium hydroxide, we're at an amount of HA that is consistent with simple acid dissociation equilibrium of that acid. So we may have some A- minus around. It depends on the strength of that acid. In particular, for weak acids, we won't have that much. For strong acids, we'll have quite a bit. But as the NaOH is, is added, let's imagine this is a weak acid. So we'll have very little A- minus around to start with. I'll kind of draw it smaller to indicate that. As we add the base, more and more A- minus starts to come in because we're adding hydroxide, pushing this reaction to the right. And so in the middle of the curve, we'll have close to equal amounts of HA and A-. Minus. And as we continue on, HA gets smaller and smaller, and the amount of A- minus continues to increase. At the equivalence point, we have essentially no more HA remaining. It's completely A- minus at this point, and that's exactly the point where the base has completely neutralized the HA in the original analyte. Where I want to focus is halfway between the equivalence point and the starting point. To a rough approximation, for a weak acid, we start out with no A-minus. 
And we're going to make that approximation so that we can do something really useful with that halfway point between the equivalence point and the zero point. If we start out with no a minus and we end with all a minus, then halfway between that traversal, halfway between that addition of titrant, we reach a place, and I'll just kind of draw an arbitrary point here, where the number of moles of HA is equal to the number of moles of A minus. Halfway between the addition of all of the NaOH to completely neutralize, we've neutralized half. And at that point, the half HA remaining equals the half of A minus we've created. At this point where HA equals A minus, we can say the same thing about their concentrations, of course. HA equals A minus. And writing out the equilibrium expression for this acid reveals something pretty neat. So Ka is equal to the H3O plus concentration times the A minus concentration divided by the HA concentration. When the two are equal, they divide to 1, and so we recognize notably that the Ka is equal to the hydronium ion concentration. And the hydronium ion concentration, of course, is just 10 to the negative pH value, right? So we're measuring that. So this is a way to actually measure the Ka of an acid by simply doing the titration, going to halfway between the starting point and the equivalence point along the x-axis, and then projecting that point's y value back onto the y-axis, or really just inspecting its pH, this pH is equal to the pKa of the acid. Pretty remarkable, right? Comes from this approximation that we start off with almost no A-, minus, so that at the halfway point, we can say that HA concentration equals A- minus concentration. Well, I haven't drawn it terribly well, but in the vicinity of this point, where HA and A- minus concentrations are equal, we're in what's called a buffer region. And you'll see why it's called a buffer region if you pay attention to the changes in pH that occur as we add titrin and kind of compare those to the rest of the curve. So in the vicinity of this place where HA equals A-, minus, you'll notice that the changes in pH with addition of titrin are relatively small, especially compared to around the equivalence point where they're just absolutely flying, right? If we add acid or base at the equivalence point, the pH is going to shoot down or up respectively. That's not true where HA equals A minus, and we actually know the reason for that already. At this point where HA and A minus are equal, what do we have? Well, we have a weak acid and its conjugate base in solution, and their concentrations are equal to each other. We have a name for that. It's called a buffer. And what do buffers do? They resist changes in pH. And we see that manifesting itself on the pH curve. The changes in pH are relatively small for a set addition of moles of titrant. The solution that we've created by adding strong base to a solution of the weak acid not enough to completely neutralize it, but enough to produce quite a bit of A-, minus, acts as a buffer. And this is one of those tricky buffer questions that you'll see, where you start with a weak acid and you add a strong base, or you start with a weak base and you add a strong acid to it to create a buffer. We're seeing that in action on a titration curve. This helps explain why the titration curve starts out relatively flat, because until we reach a point where the buffer is broken, we're in the buffer region. And for some titrations, you'll actually notice that it starts out quite steep as well. That's because we need a little bit of A- minus to come in before we can actually get to a buffer situation. But once we've broken the buffer, it's off to the races. Now you may be wondering why the curve flattens out. It's a really good question. If we just keep adding base, shouldn't the pH continue to increase? Actually, the answer is no, and the limitation comes from the titrant itself. We can measure the pH of the titrant, measure the pH of that NaOH solution, and that has a set value. And we can't get past that pH by adding more titrant. We'll be stuck at that concentration of hydroxide after a time. So the titration curve approaches the pH of the titrant asymptotically.